Tomorrow's energy is new energy, in which natural gas will be used alongside innovative forms, such as green gas and hydrogen. New energy needs a new network. That is why SNAM has launched a program marking an evolutionary leap in our infrastructure. Tomorrow's network is based on a management model in which assets are not only governed in real time, but they can also interact, modifying their behavior based on the process data. An active form of management based on predictive risk models that leverages the most advanced digital technologies and the IoT to improve management of the territory, optimize maintenance, and minimize emissions. Tomorrow's network will transport green gas to accelerate decarbonization, and through power to gas, it will be a pillar of the integrated renewable energy system. Tomorrow's network is a 4.0 infrastructure that is even safer, more sustainable and flexible and ready to inspire the world because there is no energy without a network. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and Welcome to SNAM's nine-month results and strategy update and presentation. Thank you to all of those who have joined us here in our headquarters in uh, San Donato Milanese in Milan, and thanks to those of you who are following us remotely. Today we will update you on our progress over the last nine months and the solid progress we're making on our strategy. We will also highlight the positive momentum we're seeing in the gas sector in Europe and in Italy, and the increased visibility on the regulatory context. The combination of our outperformance and the better outlook underpins the new strategic plan, which improves on all main targets, enabling us to deliver enhanced earnings and shareholder returns. Alessandra will now take you through our results for the first nine months of the year. Thank you, Marco, and good morning, everyone. Over the first nine months of the year, we have delivered on each of the pillars of the strategic plan. Our CAPEX is on track to meet our full year guidance of around 900 million. Our efficiency plan is progressing well since its launch in 2016, and we are set to deliver more than 30 million euro of overall savings by year end. On balancing incentives, we've increased our revenues by 80% versus the same period of last year. Moving to energy transition, the first nine months of the year, we have acquired three industry-leading technologies in the mobility, energy efficiency, and biogas, biomethane sector, and progress the rollout of our SNAM for the mobility effort, which is gaining traction. We expect to have 50 contracted CNG, LCNG stations by year-end. With reference to our international activities, we expect DESPA closing by year-end, and TAP has recently restarted work for the winter season. As a result of our efforts and competence on optimization of financial structure, we now expect to have a full year cost of debt of 1.5% compared to original guidance of 1.8%. Assuming the completion of a further 230 million buyback since our first half results call, full year net debt is expected to be 11.7 billion in line with guidance and including tap through up connected to financial close targeted by year-end. Financial results in the period have been strong. Revenues grew by 4% thanks to positive gas demand dynamics where consumption in the first nine months was around 52 BCM, broadly in line with 2017. Normalizing the impact from the French nuclear outage and for rainfalls, demand was slightly up. The increase in the asset base the full contribution from the acquisition of ETG and the output base incentive on balancing activities. EBITDA was up 3.3% as a result of DNA from our growing asset base, efficiency which offset demerged synergies and labor cost inflation, 
The overall cost base also includes new activities which are in a ramp-up phase and some one-off cost. Net income was up 5%, also as a result of balance sheet optimization. The strong cash flow generation driven by the positive operational results and the working capital more than offset investments and dividend in the period while we use about 300 million of financial flexibility to buy back stock over the first nine months of the year. These results position us to deliver a third year of outperformance with our net income up 20% since the demerger of Italgas. This thanks to strong results in our core business, leveraging on asset growth and positive market context, our efficiency plan, solid contribution from our associates, and for about 40% of the overall net income growth since 2016 from a proactive optimization of our financial structure. As well as over-delivering on target, we have consolidated our capabilities, streamlining processes and internalizing technologies and expanding our international footprint. This effort will pay off in our future. Let me now hand it over to Marco for our new strategic plan. Thanks, Ale. The external context is increasingly supportive for, Na for SNAM. The outlook for gas in Europe continues to improve. The renewed sense of urgency on climate change, air quality and rising concerns on energy cost increases a focus on immediately available and affordable solutions. All over Europe, we're seeing measures to phase out coal. This is by far the quickest and cheapest way to reduce CO2 while we continue to invest in new technologies for the future. Gas is also emerging as a key lever to decarbonize transport, and we see an opportunity for CNG and LNG in mobility to reach 30 BCM by 2030 to improve air quality. The most relevant long-term feature of this new energy outlook is that gas is no longer only a transition fuel, but thanks to the development of green and low carbon gas, it's also a key pillar of a long-term deeply decarbonized Europe. In Italy, the biomethane incentive has led to over 800 preliminary inquiries from producers to connect to our grid. New power to gas projects in Northern Europe are being built. In short, green gas is taking off. The intrinsic value of gas and green gas as a lever for decarbonization comes from existing transport and storage infrastructure. Their significant cost advantage and their scale compared to other vectors. Storage is particularly relevant in Italy and Europe where gas demand for households is eight times higher in the winter than it is in the summer. So this means we need seasonal storage to cater for these peaks. Gas storage is not only very cheap, but it also offers a unique opportunity of storing renewable energy seasonally. This will happen today via biomethane and tomorrow from renewable solar and wind power through power to gas. The work we have done at SNAM together with other TSOs in the climate, Gas for Climate initiative shows that Europe can save 140 billion euros a year by decarbonizing heating and power gen through a combination of renewable gas and renewable electricity instead of doing it 100% with electricity. Among policymakers around Europe, there's a growing view that maintaining the gas networks in a top condition in the long term is a no regrets option for Europe as it seeks effective and affordable climate policies. We expect, therefore, the upcoming European gas market review to be positive and explicit in this regard. The increasing positive momentum on the long-term gas narrative comes along a sustained demand recovery in Europe, which has added more than 65 billion cubic meters of demand since 2014. Meanwhile, news flow on European domestic production is not as positive. We expect Groningen to close sometime before 2030 and indigenous production in Northern Europe and in Italy is declining fast, in some cases faster than expected. The consequent increase in import requirements is significant and this will be challenged by very strong Asian demand and growing Asian demand for LNG, particularly in the winter, as we have seen last year in a very tight market. A similar picture is emerging in Italy where demand recovery from 2014 has added 13 BCM and Italy also has memories of a tight winter. We have carried out with uh, Snamerita gas engineers a technical assessment which confirms the necessity of continuing to invest 
in 100% of our infrastructure, even at demand levels that are less than half those of today. And even at these unrealistically low levels in the long term, gas tariffs would still be significantly lower than electricity transport tariffs. The regulatory environment is also evolving positively. After the conclusion of the observation period, the WAC mark to market, mark to market could lead to a WAC of up to for up to 5.8%, up from 5.4%. There could be a gradual increase in the leverage, which may bring this down somewhat. The WAC for 2019-2021 will be confirmed by the authority before the end of the year. On Monday, we met again with a new regulator, appointed in August 2018, and they confirmed their commitment to stability, visibility, and transparency on the regulatory framework. They recently released a final consultation document for the fifth regulatory period that will start in 2020. The document again highlights the central role of gas in the energy system, also given the evolution of green gas, the importance of investing in R&D to decarbonize, and an increased focus on asset resilience. More, more punctually, the constructive approach in the document translates into maintaining incentives on development capex and remuneration of the work in progress for transport confirming the inclusion of substitution investments in the RAB without specific CBAs, cost-benefit analysis, the intention to develop specific output-based incentive schemes to ensure the efficiency of the maintenance initiatives, and the termination to introduce new incentive schemes to reward measures on market liquidity, to encourage innovation and decarbonization, and also a confirmation that TOTEX will be postponed to the sixth regulatory period. All these elements you will find in the, in the uh, consultation document. So in this supportive environment, we've defined and built our new plan. As you can see, our overall strategic direction hasn't changed. We continue to focus on the improvement of the core business by investing in people, in technologies, and efficiency to deliver sustainable growth in our RAB and to enhance our industry-leading capabilities. We are further consolidating our position in the energy transition with a growing contribution that we expect from the new businesses and services, which also increase not only the profits, but also the strategic relevance of our core assets. We are first movers in these significant and attractive markets. Overall, innovation and decarbonization are a strong feature of this plan as we build the energy company of tomorrow. Our affiliates will provide Solid and growing contribution, also driven by the TAP pipeline, which is expected to be completed and up and running in 2020. We will create value from the optimization of the financial structure, and we will continue to enhance the value also coming from the financial flexibility that we have on the balance sheet. Before looking at each of these pillars in more detail, I would like to highlight our leadership on ESG. ESG is becoming not only the right and the necessary thing to do, but we see it uh, growingly as a key lever for long-term business success. On the environment, we're actively supporting climate change and clean air objectives by reducing the impact of our own activities and helping our clients reduce also their fit footprint through energy efficiency. For example, we target a decrease of 25% in methane emissions to 2025, up from our previous target of 10%. And we're leading industry efforts with other TSOs to define better, better measurements and, and protocols and processes for this important area. Um, to the, the, of course, the long-term uh, growth potential of, of our business will depend on our people. Needless to say, safety is a core priority, but we've launched a new program called SNAM for Safety where we want to take our safety efforts one step further. Mean, meanwhile, uh, we also invest on our competences and have launched uh, the SNAM Institute where we've offered 90,000 hours of training, not only to our own uh, people, but also to those uh, that work with us. On average, we have 1,000 construction sites open and we've estimated that our CapEx has a multiplier effect on the Italian economy of, of around three times. 
uh, we we are closer and closer to the communities where we operate, and so we've set up a SNAM Foundation to uh, bring our skills and our knowledge uh, to benefit the territories where we operate. Uh, from a governance perspective, we have industry-leading uh, practices. Over half our board is made up of independents who chair all the board committees, and I would also add that uh, the board maintains oversight of our climate-related risks and opportunities. Let's now move to the plan. Starting with CAPEX, we will invest 5.7 million by 2022. This is up from 5.2 billion in the previous plan. The three key elements in the plan are first, an increase in the investment required for maintenance and particularly for replacements. This enhanced effort on substitution and maintenance reflects our constantly updated analysis of what is the most efficient and effective way of delivering asset resilience to our customers. This approach, applied to the new plan period, require around 500 million euros of extra capex just in substitutions. Development spending accounts for a quarter of the overall plan and includes the interconnection of TAP, which is about 290 million euros. This is the SNAM part of, of the TAP interconnection. Um, interconnection in the Northwest to support the local market and cross-border flows and the Sardinia backbone, which is still in our plan, which weighs around 300 million euros. We also have investment, uh, development investment in the additional layer of the Fiumetreste uh, storage field. In this plan, we've inserted more than 200 million euros of additional investments in renewable energy and sustainable mobility. This is for new infrastructure uh, for biomethane and also to provide gas for the transport sector via CNG and LNG. Across the plan, around 800 million euros of investments relate to our tech project, increasing operational effectiveness, innovation and decarbonization, reflecting our focus on building the energy company of the future. Let's look at tech in more detail. So all the investments in tech are RAB-based investments, with the exception of the 200 million that we allocated for the new businesses, which will have uh, contracted uh, revenue uh, nature. So tech has three key objectives. The first is operational effectiveness. All the initiatives will enable us to carry out our operations faster and better through technology and innovation. The second area of focus is reduction of emissions, both CH4 and CO2. This involves equipment updates and the use of technology to enhance energy efficiency. The third objective, as mentioned, is to lead the energy transitions. Today, through new business investments in biomethane and in CNG and LNG, and tomorrow through innovative work we're beginning to do on power to gas and on the hydrogen value chain. The tech project, with its focus on consolidating and expanding capabilities, also creates additional opportunities for SNAM global solutions, as we're able to export and make a margin on selling some of our competences. I will now hand over to Massimo Derchi, our Chief Industrial Asset Officer, for a more detailed look at our projects. Thank you, Marco. Good morning to all. Can we skip the slide? Okay, the first example of our innovative projects for operational effectiveness is SNAM's asset management system. SmartGas integrates and manages in a single database all asset information from design to operation and man maintenance and uh, supports and checks our field workers step by step. The key benefit is the minimization of risk of operational mistakes, delayed or missed inspections or maintenance, use of wrong parts, etc. Operational and maintenance information like type and duration of maintenance required for each part are automatically and consistently added to the schemes during the design phase. As a result, long-term planning for all preventive maintenance for all our assets is automatically generated. Short-term schedules are then automatically generated as well for all our workers. Single activities are optimized and balanced to avoid workload peaks, reduce transfer time, and optimize routes 
taking into account workers' specific roles and skills, and the scheduling system manages suppliers' agenda as well. All features of SmartGas are available to our on-field workers through their iPads. Each asset can be displayed on cartography in a variety of modes. Online and offline navigation systems show public and also private routes to reach each area of a network, while augmented reality displays 3D pipeline paths and the location of any relevant asset. All database data and information can be accessed by the workers and data from on-field assets are received and recorded. Failures and anomalies are recorded and sent to operation and maintenance department to be further checked and relevant maintenance costs are transferred to SNAMS ERP. We believe that smart gas is indeed at the forefront of industry management system and we will have a demo for analysts during lunch time on that. The second example is a new application which has been made available to dispatching control room to monitor the status of tur turbochargers. The turbochargers are the turbines which drive the compressor for our network and our storage facilities, which work on uh, all compressing stations and support decision making relevant to the operations. The aim is to keep turbochargers work most of the time within the optimal condition in order to reduce emission and fuel gas consumed by the turbines, preserve asset and decrease maintenance cost, improve turbine operation knowledge inside the dispatching unit. The tool provides a complete single view of all compressing stations, about 50 turbines, and their key parameters, including an intuitive alarm system that highlights suboptimal operating condition. Moreover, it is possible to focus on a single turbocharger, displaying details on its technical uh, key parameter, and an intuitive visualization of operating condition of a specific compressor and its turbine map. Historical operating conditions and key parameters values over the last 72, 72 hours are always available. From a technical point of view, the new solution is based on a big data infrastructure that manages near 1 million data points per day collecting data from different enterprise systems. And finally, during 2019, an artificial intelligence procedure will be implemented to support the decision making during critical solution. Uh, as, well as, as well as introducing you to some of the more innovative elements of the plan, I wanted to highlight the rationale for our significant asset resilience investment program. Maintaining the SNAM network is more capex intensive than it is typical for this business, and this comes down to three key factors. The first and more important is the specific geomorphology of Italy. Almost half of our network is in hilly or mountainous regions and require frequent inspection and maintenance. More than 15,000 kilometers of pipelines on a network of about 32,500 kilometers are periodically controlled by geologists in order to check ground movements along the line. In critical landslide areas, ground movement and stresses on the pipelines are automatically measured and monitored in real time. We have about 600 areas like that. If significant pipeline stresses are detected and envisaged, the soil around the pipe is excavated, the pipeline is made free to stretch. In some cases, operating pressures are then decreased. At a point in time, such measures may become so significant and or so frequent to affect regular operation. We intervene much before such threshold is reached, also considering that permitting design and construction time typically may, may last up to four or five years, and we replace the pipeline in part or in full. The second factor is linked to the growing density of population around part of our network, which was originally built in scarcely populated areas. Replacement may therefore be at the point in time required. The last remarks about the fact that much of our, our network was built between the 50s and the 70s. And uh, older pipeline typically require additional maintenance cost and or operation constraints. Here again, the public interest may therefore be best served by replacement. I will now hand you back to Marco for the rest of the business. Thank you. Thank you, Massimo. The, the investment, the sum of the investment opportunities that we've outlined 
will drive the RAB growth of 2.5% a year on average between 17 and 22. This will have obviously a positive impact on the revenues. Looking ahead even beyond 2022, as Massimo outlined clearly, the CapEx requirement and the long-term CapEx requirements of our network will ensure long-term RAB growth broadly in line with the plan, meaning that we have a clear visibility on over a decade of growth and value creation. On top of our RAB-based remuneration, as mentioned, the fifth regulatory period will see a growing role for output-based incentives. We expect to do better even in a tightening regulatory requirement on the already existing balancing incentive that we provide. We will shortly be launching new services to optimize the flexible utilization of storage capacity and from 2020 we expect the introduction of a new set of output-based incentives on asset integrity, market functioning, quality of service and sustainability and innovation. These will be determined specifically through a consultation in 2019 which will start shortly. As far as NAM Global Solutions, we will, as mentioned, leverage the competences that we're developing to create value within and outside Europe and we're already gaining through SNAM Global Solutions exposure to some very attractive gas markets. And we also expect to continue to create value through SNAM Global Solutions from and for our international affiliates. So output-based revenues, uh, of course, require more limited additional costs, so the margins are quite significant. Whereas for SNAM Global Solutions, we continue to expect contract margin of around 15%. This is excluding overheads in line uh, with businesses of this nature. So overall, we expect cumulated revenues over the plan period from a combination of the output-based incentives and SNAM Global Solutions to be around 250 million euros up from our previous target of 150 million euros. Another source of value creation is our ongoing efficiency program. We have more than 100 uh, initiatives within this program. Alessandra is leading the effort and it has delivered above expectations both in speed and in scope. Now we target overall savings of above 60 million by 2022, up from our original 25 million. That means that our core business costs before pass-throughs and one-offs will be lower in 2022 than they were in 2016, even accounting for labor cost inflation, demerger synergies, and additional costs. For instance, the one related to the network expansion, we're managing a grower as a, a larger asset base and the money we're spending on training which we're undertaking to invest as mentioned in our business. We continue to leverage new technologies whether they're satellites, drones, new sensors as Massimo mentioned and of course artificial intelligence to continue to reduce these costs and we're also looking again at our processes and procedures to streamline them and to adapt our rules to new systems as opposed to trying to adapt systems to existing rules. So there's a lot of very heavy lifting on, on processes and procedures that's, that's ongoing. The second pillar of our strategy, as mentioned, is to position SNAM for the energy transition in areas, only in areas, where we possess a clear and distinctive positioning and, I would say, now competences. So we plan to be a first mover and a market leader in green gas and in gas for transport infrastructure. Overall, we plan to invest at least 200 million at an average return of around 10% unlevered. This excludes around 90 million of RAB investments that have to do with the new interconnections deriving from the green businesses. And these are not only our businesses, but also third party uh, biomethane or CNG LNG plants, LNG uh, compressor stations. So on, on the whole um, energy transition, I would say that we have three integrated initiatives. These are uh, first to support the penetration of gas for mobility by building and operating compression infrastructure and fueling stations. Here we receive, let's call it a quasi-regulated return in the form of long-term contracts 
from the petrol distributors who want to rent uh, and, and have us build and manage the station. Second, mindful of the increasing demand for LNG, especially from trucking and, and coming quickly also from shipping, we've decided to build some very small micro liquefaction terminals directly connected to our networks. Uh, we've determined that this is very competitive uh, compared to today. We're importing from France, from Holland, um, from Spain, uh, LNG on, on, on trucks and trains. So the ability to liquefy gas and make it available for the local market in, in our assessment is, is very attractive and profitable. And third, our most recent business, which is the one of biomethane infrastructure, here we've earmarked at least 100 million of investments in new capacity. In addition to these three integrated business, we will continue to grow our ESCO, which is called TEP, offering energy efficiency services to the residential and the industrial sector. Let's look a little bit more closely at our strategy in biomethane, which is the one we hadn't talked about before in detail. So uh, the Italian incentive covers around 1.1 BCM of gas. Um, and this is mainly done for transport. And this lasts for 10 years. Overall, as we've mentioned uh, previously, we estimate an overall market size of around 8 billion cubic meters. So here we're talking about the first 1.1 billion. And here we target a 5% market share. So SNAM targets a 5% market share of 1.1 billion out of a potential market of 8 billion cubic meters. Uh, we are looking to invest in the infrastructure itself. We want to do that either alone or in partnership with local investors. And we've received already a preliminary green light uh, from the EU on these types of investments. This investment is attractive because for SNAM, it could generate... Uh, profits the investments in five ways. First, in the case of waste, organic fraction of the municipal solid waste, what we call forsu in Italy, you get paid to take it. So there's a revenue coming from the forsu. Second, there's a revenue coming from selling the gas on the PSV. Third, there's an incentive of around 60 euros per megawatt hour when we sell this gas on the PSV. Fourth, there's an incentive if the project is also an investor in CNG, so you get an extra incentive if you can somewhat combine the, the biomethane and the CNG investment. And fifth, in case that project or other projects are developed with the IES technology, which is the company that we've acquired, we get an extra margin from internalizing the profit that IES is making. I must say that we're surprised on the positive side, not only for the types of returns that we can make on these investments, but also for the number of concrete investment opportunities that our team is looking at. And not only is this a very attractive and secure investment in itself, but it also supports and underpins the central role of the network in the renewable uh, energy space for the very long term. Turning now to our international businesses. This afternoon, their detailed strategies will be uh, the focus of one of the sessions. All the material will be available on our website, but let's go over some of the highlights. Regarding uh, Terega, uh, the, the news here is that France has decided to regulate storage, so France has decided to follow somewhat the Italian model. This opens the door for additional financial optimization of the capital structure of this business and here we continue to work uh, with with the joint teams to try to extract as much value as we can from this investment in Austria we are continuing to optimize again the financial structure and the operations of this business we have quite predictable and visible regulation on this front in the UK there will be an additional contribution from the new stake we've acquired in interconnector which is uh, being rediscovered as a, as a key strategic asset for the UK as it copes with a severe shortage of storage uh, in that market. Uh, TAP uh, continues to progress, is now uh, over 80% complete. Works have restarted in Italy uh, after, the, after the summer break. We confirm startup in 2020 and first gas. Financing is also on track. We expect financing to uh, be completed in the coming weeks. 
uh, and TAP will contribute around 50 million euros of net income by the end of the plan. In Greece, DESFA is expected to close by year end. So overall, we expect more than 160 million euros of contribution from our international business by the end of the plan. And this corresponds to approximately 500 million of pro rata, pro forma EBITDA, which is obviously not a directly relevant measure, but just to give an indication, 500 million of EBITDA from just the international businesses by the end of the plan. So I will now hand back to Ale for a closer look at how we can create value from our financial structure, which is the fourth pillar of our strategy. Thank you, Marco. Looking forward, our focus remains on de-risking our business plan, managing the impact of a potential increase in interest rate and market volatility. Over the past two years, we have focused on taking advantage of the benign market environment to accelerate reduction of our cost of debt, also via three liability management exercises, de-risking the impact of the expected rate increase pre-edging 40% of bonds expiring up to 2021, and increasing the fixed to floating rate debt. We've also carried out 1 billion of funding to be well placed in the context of rising volatility that we've seen recently. We've worked to extend the tenor and size as part of the pre-funding of our banking facilities, locking in the good terms that characterize the market up until the summer break. All of the above actions have significantly reduced our exposure to a worsening macro environment and reduced cost of debt to 1.5% ahead of uh, the most recently provided guidance of 1.6%. Other elements that give us confidence uh, are the following. We are using the current forward curve and credit spread environment, which effectively means a scenario where BTP to bond spread remains at current levels for the entire plan. A below average European, a below European average leverage, natural hedge embedded in our business model. On this point, in a rising interest rate environment, this non-performance is protected by the periodic WAC update, which impact assets more than liabilities, the negative and positive correlation between financial variables, interest rate and credit spread on one side and interest rate and infl inflation respectively, the significant discount we have been trading at versus the BTP. To manage this risk, as you will hear in our workshop in the afternoon, we carry out an asset and liability mon model which, via statistical analysis, uh, aligns and optimizes our cost of debt evolution with regulatory windows, reducing the risk of a mismatch between action and regulatory assumption and, therefore, our cash flow at risk. Finally, we have upsides from a further treasury management optimization, which will also be pursued uh, with recourse to commercial paper market, an opportunistic approach in maturity profile management, further diversification of investors thanks to our green financing as well as new EIB funding, normalization of country risk premium. As an example, should the spread between the BTP and the Bund go back to the pre-summer levels for the entire plan horizon, this would provide an additional 0.4% CAGR to our base EPS CAGR. And despite current levels, if we were to assume the rollover of the outstanding high coupon bonds at currently SNAM yield levels, with tenors in line with expiring ones, this would imply an average saving in excess of 100 basis points. SNAM stock credit quality is confirmed by the six-time oversubscription of our September bond and by credit spread trading well below those of the sovereign. Despite Moody's recent downgrade, we remain committed to our previous credit metrics and as such we will continue to consider 50.5% as a self-imposed guidance or 60% net debt to wrap as an, on an adjusted basis as our ceiling. We expect average gearing due to the plan um, to remain broadly stable. This leaves some room for potential additional investments not included in our current plan to which we will apply the strict discipline which has guided our investment decision to date. We will only invest at or above the risk-adjusted returns available on regulated organic capex and we are committed to our current rating matrix and risk profile. Furthermore, we assess opportunities based on whether they enhance the value of our existing assets, allows NAM to play an industrial role and support additional growth and strategic optionality. That means we look carefully at investment opportunities which have strategic coherence with assets we already own 
and provide entry points into new growing gas market uh, with a view of generating further growth potential also via Greenfield. Our financial capability also plays a role in our shoulder return approach. In fact, we have invested almost 700 million euro in buying back our stock. Let me end it over to Marco. Thank you. The strategy we've outlined so far delivers an enhanced earnings profile and superior shareholder returns over the plan period. Tariff RAB will grow by an average of 2.5% a year, up from 2% over the previous plan, driven by investments in the core business. RAB growth will, of course, support revenues, which will also benefit from the WAC update in 2019 and the contribution from output-based incentives and the new businesses going forward. This, coupled with the increased focus on cost containment, will drive EBITDA growth of 3.5% a year. Further efficiency on financial costs will accelerate this growth at the net income level to about 4% a year. This CAGR assumes rising debt costs towards the end of the plan, implied by the current rather flat forward curves, and a constant regulatory framework. We expect EPS to grow more than net income to over 5% CAGR, thanks to the buyback already carried out or expected to the end of 2018 and to the planned share cancellation. The increasingly positive context with potential opportunities both for our core business and the energy transition space could lead to earnings upside as we deploy our financial capability and flexibility. We also maintain the additional buyback optionality. The accelerated growth profile and its long-term sustainability enable us today to set our dividend policy to 5% growth per year from 21.55 euro cents in 2017 while maintaining our payout within the 70-80% range over the plan period. So all key metrics in our plan have been improved. This slide sums up all the new targets versus a previous plan and our guidance for 2019. The key elements of the guidance for 19 are capex around 1 billion, net income in line with plan CAGR and net debt broadly in line with the one expected for the close of 2018. So, summing up, SNAM today is in a sweet spot. Climate change and clean air are now high on the political agenda across Europe. People are demanding solutions that will impact now and not in decades time. That's, that puts gas and gas infrastructure in a good position. On the basis of this improved outlook, our track record of outperformance and all the work done over the last few years to internalize new competences and to streamline the processes, we're today presenting a plan which is improved on all our key metrics. We are also in a unique position in our industry of having a clear line of sight on value creation to 2030 and beyond, driven by investment requirements of our RAB and the growing opportunity in green gas and mobility. Looking beyond 2030, we expect to be transporting growing quantities of green gas in our pipeline as biomethane takes off, and also to be hosting solar and wind power through power to gas conversion. Overall, the gas grid will become an energy grid, and investments made today will enable an affordable energy transition in Europe. In this context, SNAM is in an ideal position. We are large enough to have an impact and lead the evolution in our market, but we're small enough for the activities that we undertake to have a meaningful and positive impact on our company, shaping our business as we continue to grow. Thank you very much for your attention. Ale and I will be pleased to answer any questions. We will take questions both from the room and the conference call. Uh, as a reminder for who's connected via, via the conference call, you should press star one to register for a question. And please say your name and company name before taking the question. Uh, 
was three questions on my side. First of all, on uh, the GB on topics uh, that you have in uh, in uh, new new investments. Uh, you mentioned the return uh, about ten percent. You can uh, uh, provide a bit more uh, color on this and possibly the contribution of money to just have uh, these businesses at the end uh, of the of the plan. Uh, secondly, on the capex, uh, you mentioned the need of uh, uh, Sorry for that. No problem. <laughs> um, uh, maintenance and substitution capex due to the peculiarity of your network. Uh, if you can uh, give us a hint of uh, the sustainable level of this capex uh, that you expect uh, also beyond uh, the period of the, the business plan. And uh, uh, finally, a question on uh, on the cost of debt. Uh, you highlighted in the slide. Uh, I assume that. Uh, you, you are uh, uh, assuming that we'll go to around 2% at the end of, uh, of the plan. If you can uh, give us some uh, sensitivity on, uh, on uh, the risk that you see considering the volatility interest rates on this assumption. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So on the 200 million investments in new businesses. So by new businesses, as I mentioned, we mean biomethane, CNG, compressor stations, and small liquefactors connected to the network. Um, on average, we say 10%. So some will be below 10%, some will be above 10%. In looking at these investments, the strict financial criteria that Ale mentioned apply. So we will only invest if returns on a risk-adjusted basis are higher than our regulated uh, returns. And uh, you can work out of, of that number, the, the EBITDA, quite easily. Uh, on, on this type of business. So, but I don't want to commit to 10% for each and every investment. This is, this is the average uh, number, which is similar to our international uh, businesses. These businesses, on the case of the biomethane, uh, are, are, are incentivized businesses, so they don't have a revenue risk. In the case of CNG, they're backed by long-term rent contracts with credit-worthy counterparts. And in the case of, uh, of the LNG, we're building infrastructure where we have a significant cost advantage compared to, to the competition. Regarding the maintenance and substitution, so uh, Massimo, I think, uh, went into quite some detail as to why these investments are necessary. I must say the regulator and the government see eye to eye on the need to enhance as much as possible the asset integrity, I would say, of all the infrastructure, including ours. The run rate you could say just to, to rule of thumb would be between seven and 800 million over the next, call it 10, 15 years, uh, which, is, uh, which, is, uh, which is what drives a long-term outlook. Now, um, in, one, in, in the slides we showed, we say that 9,000 kilometers of the network will exceed 50 years of duration in the plant period. Now, if you take a rule of thumb of between one and three million euros per kilometer, that would generate huge capex. We're not advocating for all the 50-year-old pipelines to be replaced, as Massimo mentioned. And as I mentioned when talking about the output-based incentives, we will work with the regulator to substitute where necessary or to enhance life where is more convenient. So we always look at, even if substitutions don't require, per se, a cost-benefit analysis, we always look at doing what is the most cost-effective and safe a solution for the customers. Regarding cost of, that, of debt, uh, we uh, essentially lock in today's forward curves. So if you look at today's forward curves, they're basically flat. So we have an improvement in our numbers compared to the previous plan coming from the WAC, uh, but we have a deterioration coming from a forward curve which is very different from the one that we were using in the previous plan. Um, I, I don't think we have any risks, uh, given that we're using what, what could be in the long term considered quite a, a pessimistic view, but we haven't taken our own view, we've just taken what the market view is. Ale, I don't know if you want, you want to add something. Yeah, on, on, the, on the cost of debt side, you're right that at the, towards the end of the plan we go above 2% as a result of two things. Uh, the forward curve, which uh, uh, is expected to, to grow in near term and then flatten a bit. Um, and we take the current spread as it was where to remain the same, so 300 basis points through the life of the plan. So 
in all honesty, we probably may have more of an upside rather than downside because at some point, hopefully, things will normalize. And as I said, if we, it was to normalize, it would mean 0 0.4, 0 0.5% better CAGR on our EPS. Equally, if we were to assume for the next two years uh, a spread that actually worsen, that would balance this improvement in EPS term. So our plan, we think, is very solid in, in this respect. Thank you. It's ha uh, Javier Suarez at, at Mediobanca. Uh, three questions on my side, too. Uh, the first one is on, uh, on uh, slide 2021. 20, um, you are mentioning a total of uh, 250 million euros of accumulated revenues. Um, if you can give us uh, uh, the number of EBITDA that is on your business plan corresponding to those businesses, I guess the output-based incentive has a marginality close to 100 percent. But I was wondering if you can give us the breakdown, because the uh, uh, some global solutions should be a, a kind of contracted activity, and I think you mentioned something at 15% margin, so you can give us the EBITDA number that is in your plan uh, corresponding to this output-based incentive and SNAM Global Solution activity. Then the second question is on the on the slide number uh, 25 on the international on the international activities. Um, you mentioned something like a pro rata EBITDA of 500 million euros by the end of the plan. You can give us the pro rata EBITDA at the beginning of the plan and also the pro rata debt corresponding to those activities. And, um, and the third question is on the, on the financial structure of the company. Um, uh, if I'm not wrong, the, uh, the company should have the net debt to total wrap at a level close to 50, 52 percent through the, through the business plan. So uh, if, uh, given the fact that your ceiling is significantly higher, can you help us to understand why the company has decided to maintain that level significantly below and why the company has not decided to move, to move up uh, the gear in assumption to 57, 58, 60 percent? The rationale behind that will be appreciated. Thank you. So I will. Uh, I will answer, and then Ale, maybe you can fill in on the on the last one. So, on the 250 million, um, it's I think premature to to be too specific because, as I mentioned, the regulator in 2019 will be setting and working with us and and defining those output-based incentives. To give you some guidance, however, I think what we can say is that if you if you take a yearly average, uh, you get to about 50 million of revenue between the two the two businesses, and you could almost split that half and half. And I wouldn't say that it's 100% marginality on output based because we, uh, like in the case of balancing, they're very attractive margins, but we've had to build a system and AI and weather and, uh, and demand forecasting based on weather. So they're, they're challenging, they're challenging. If you, if you ask our team, who's, some are here in the room, it's, it's, a, it's a real effort to beat. The regulator doesn't give us free money. So they, they are really tough in setting uh, hurdles that so far we've been able to exceed to their great satisfaction, by the way, because if you ask shippers in Italy, I think they would confirm that the balancing has really been a win-win-win. Uh, the market is more transparent, more liquid, and, and our customers are happier. And of course, we make what is a fair margin. Um, so I think I've, I've given you as much as I'm willing to say on the, on the split between those two businesses. On the international, I think you find in our uh, six-month results the uh, the eh? yeah no we said in in the half-year results we talked about the pro forma EBITDA for the first six months of 18 which is 175 uh, did we give guidance on the debt no we gave guidance at operating level but if you do the math it's you know, you get slightly above 1 billion mm -hmm. you can do the for, math. for the debt um, regarding the the 52 I think what we're saying, and, and that's why we showed that extra EPS outperformance, we're saying, um, and by the way, I think our, our gearing is slightly higher than, than 52, but I'll, I will let Ale uh, comment. But we, we have a plan, as we've had, which s substantially self-finances itself. There's some, some uh, increasing of leverage, but not much. And, and we preserve some of this financial flexibility and we're, we, we are using that either for new projects that we see, uh, acceleration of something like biomethane, which, which could be the case. And as I mentioned, we preserve the buyback optionality 
uh, which is there. So I wouldn't see other ways today to absorb that, uh, that flexibility. I don't know if you want to add something. You're right on uh, an adjusted basis. That's the level that we have and that's more or less the level that we will have at the end of the plan. As always, we have next year, as we said, it's not going to be a particularly heavy capex plan, but if you divide the number of capex uh, by the years, you will get that uh, capex will go up, so it will go up and then slightly come down. So you need to think about our policy more in a holistic uh, way and not year by year, which is uh, what we need to do given the nature of our business, the long-term vision and matching with what the regulator will, uh, will apply. You will then need to adjust for rating adjustment metrics, so there is some adjustment that will need to be added on top of the roughly 52, but the more important message is that the evolution of the gearing follows the capex uh, evolution. Uh, morning, Stefano Pezzato, Credit Suisse. Uh, two questions, one more general, one part, uh, more detailed. Uh, the general one, you mentioned in your closing remarks that you have the right scale to take advantage of this uh, central role that uh, you expect gas to play in the decarbonized world. Uh, you also open, from what we understand, to new M&A opportunities. So my question is, what do you think M&A can add uh, that you currently don't have? Is it geographical di diversification? Is it anything else? Uh, and the second, more specific question uh, on the allowed return that you are assuming for your 2019 numbers, if you can give us an indication. Okay, thanks, Stefano. So on the first one, uh, when I talk about scale, I mean that um, and, and this is part of the reason I, I, I think why the EU is somewhat supportive and almost enthusiastic of the TSOs in general playing a role in biomethane because it's an activity that requires, uh, can be accelerated if you have the, the appropriate scale. But it's not an activity, even though the technology has always been there, that historically neither the electricity players nor the oil companies were very keen to, to accelerate. So I think that's, that's why we're in an attractive position because we can actually make it happen. And the 800 requests that we've seen and the workshops we've conducted and our ability to offer turnkey end-to-end -end solutions for people investing in the biomethane, in the CNG, getting and maximizing all the incentives I think is quite unique. Uh, I, don't, I, I didn't mention M&A anywhere in, in my talk. Uh, I don't think we need anything from an M&A perspective. Uh, either in terms of uh, skills or diversification or size or scope. As Ali mentioned, I think we continue to look at opportunities uh, with running them through our very strict uh, industrial and, and investment criteria. And I think to date, everything we've done has, has uh, perfectly uh, matched that. On the, um, on the geographical diversification, uh, we uh, don't diversify per se. Certainly there are markets, but we don't need M&A. China is an example of a market that's growing extremely rapidly. We haven't mentioned China in the slides. There's nothing to report on from a, from a formal point of view, but there are the numbers of, of, of agreements that we've entered into and we're gaining traction to, to get exposure to, to a market like that. Now, whether this is through a SNAP Global Solutions, whether this is through, uh, yes, biogas that does biomethane investments or Kubo gas that does uh, CNG investments. I think any, anything which, which matches our investment criteria is positive. What we like about the, the small acquisitions that we've done, so I wouldn't call that m and I would call that competence enhancing uh, and, and, and kind of insourcing. I think they've all worked very well because they now position us to have a conversation that is not simply I'll lend you the money and we can go and build a CNG station is I will build you a CNG station. And before our dialogue with utilities and municipalities on biomethane was I can, I can build uh, a plant for you or with you. They're like, you know, what are you bringing? Suddenly we're now bringing uh, yes competences and we, we know what we're talking about. So I think those types of, of, of tuck in deals have, have proven effective and I wouldn't exclude more but these are I wouldn't call this M&A um, your specific question was on the WAC do you want to answer that Ale? Um, as, as it was said just looking at the observation period what uh, you would get is up to a maximum of 5.8 um, 
we may not get there, as Marco said, as uh, the uh, leverage may gradually be increased versus current si situation. I think it's a matter of a few weeks to find out what exact numbers it will be. But we are, um, the, the formula and the application of the formula gives a very specific band within which you can guess where the WAC may come out. If, if I can add just a qualitative comment, I think it, it would be uh, difficult for us not to ask for 5.8 because that's what the formula says. I think it would be maybe a little uh, too aggressive to have 5.8 in, in our numbers. So we do expect maybe some, some uh, debt to equity adjustments. Good morning, Stefano Gambini, Equitas Sim. Three qu quick questions, if I may. First of all, regarding the RAB at the end of the period, if I'm not wrong, the tariff RAB will be 21.7 billion euros. Could you give us an idea of the working progress that you uh, expect uh, um, in, in this, uh, in this uh, RAB? The second, regarding uh, the growth of EPDA, around 400 million euros. Uh, if I'm not wrong, from uh, um, output-based incentives and uh, global solution, the contribution should be in the region of 30, 35 million euros. Then uh, we have uh, further 20 million euros for um, uh, new investments. So uh, am I wrong that uh, 350 million euros should arrive from just investments or I'm uh, losing something in the uh, breakdown of the BDA at the end? Uh, of the period compared to the current one. The last question regarding the dividend policy. Now you uh, improve substantially your dividend policy with the 5% CAG to 2025, while the, the growth of EPS is more, in la more or less in line with the previous one. So why you change your approach? Uh, where are the main risks that you see on this dividend policy if the payout, I don't know, uh, goes down? Uh, goes uh, above, sorry, 80%, you can change the dividend policy, or are there some other elements that could uh, uh, impact these uh, targets? Thanks. I will maybe answer the last one, and Ale, you can, you can take uh, the, the first two. On the, the 5%, so let's, let's go back to 2016. When we started, we had, uh, uh, before the, the demerger, we had a very high payout, and we had a much lower uh, dividend. And so the decision we took uh, last year, uh, when we did the, the first plan post demerger, was to be quite conservative on the dividend. We intentionally wanted to have uh, an outperformance of net income over dividend to bring the pay the payout back to a level that we considered sustainable, not only in the medium but in the very very long term. Now uh, we've been surprised on the upside as to how we've performed in 2017 and in 2018. So we expect a net income starting base, which is much higher than what was envis envisaged in the previous plan. So the income growth we're giving start from a much higher base, which really helps on the payout front. So we are uh, very comfortable with that 5% growth. Uh, as I mentioned in, in my remarks, in 2022, we're assuming, uh, let's say, regulatory stability, we're, which is in line with the conversations we've now had a few times with the regulator, uh, which is that of sticking to the existing framework and working uh, within that as opposed to, 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 to changing anything. Um, in terms of uh, market changes, as Alice said, I think we're nicely hedged, and I don't see that as impacting uh, that growth profile. So on, on the uh, work in progress, uh, in the last year of the plan, you have around 800 million of work in progress, for the, just for the transportation business. Uh, when it comes to the growth, I think probably it's more meaningful to look at net income level, because then you capture also something which has materially changed versus uh, um, last year, which is the debt, the, li the liability scenario, which is taken away from the power plan, as I was uh, as I was saying earlier, so you have clearly the benefit of a possibly higher WAC versus what we had in last year. You clearly have the benefit of more capex, although some of the investments are uh, towards the end of the plan, so not the full benefit of this um, fills through net income uh, by the end of this plan. So you have less growth than what otherwise the capex that you have seen would generate. Um, and then you have the uh, growth that comes in from from new businesses. Um, so in, in a way, if you were to look at the 2.4% old uh, growth, you have 
a kicker from the WAC and, and the growing wrap, effectively. And then you have uh, a non-fully reflected uh, contribution from, uh, uh, from approximately 0.5% for CapEx that have been spent and done in the, in the plan horizon, but not yet filtered through your EBIT. And of course, the negative that I was mentioning earlier of 0.5% scenario, if you want, that is taken away from past year growth. Operator, may we take one question from the conference call? Our question comes from Harry Wybert from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Hi, everybody. Thanks for taking my questions. I hope you can uh, hear me okay. It's Harry Wybers from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Um, so, so m most of my questions have actually been answered, but just, just two, uh, I guess, clarifications. Um, so firstly, on the WAC in 2022, um, was I correct to understand that the regulator has indicated that it's planning to stick to the uh, existing formula in 2022? I think the, the current formula was only due to have a shelf life of six years. Uh, ending at the end of 2021. So should we expect that this is a formula that works uh, and the regulator is happy with it uh, and that that would continue um, uh, from 2022 and beyond? Uh, and then second one, just uh, coming back on the, on the green gas, uh, obviously this is a, a renewable technology, but I wondered if you could give us some stats on, on how renewable uh, it is. If I understand correctly, you're uh, avoiding emissions from uh, or methane emissions from the waste you collect. Uh, you've obviously got no cost to extract gas from underground in the traditional way, uh, but you're still burning it at the end of the cycle. Um, th there have been lots of studies done on electric vehicles in terms of the, the full cycle emissions compared to conventional vehicles. H has there been an equivalent study on, on biogas? H how, how, how much less emissions are there from uh, renewable gas compared to normal gas? Thank you. Henry, so the, um, just to be very clear, I, I, I have not had a specific discussion, nor would it be appropriate to have one now around 2022. What I, what I said is that the regulator has indicated in very general terms that they want to preserve the visibility, predictability, and transparency of the regulatory regime, and that we don't see a reason why there should be a change uh, in 2022. And, and that's the working assumption that we have. Uh, coming, to, coming to biomethane. So biomethane is certified as being 100% renewable. And it has a huge advantage compared to any other renewable that because it's in gas form, it can be stocked at very low cost and it can be transported at very low cost and it can be delivered wherever we want it to be delivered. So you're right in saying that there's a CO2 gain from avoiding emissions that would have happened uh, as that waste went to its landfill or other sources. And that CO2 is indeed re-emitted again, but is a net zero. And this is something that's shared with, with all the NGOs, etc. You um, So when you look at a biomethane-fueled car, it is by definition the cleanest you can get, both from a CO2 and from an emissions uh, point of view. Because if you look at a well-to-wheel cycle, uh, until uh, a, a theoretical day when 100% of the uh, of the um, electricity is green, you will have CO2 in in the green mix. Um, so uh, in in the electricity mix. So uh, of course, when you do a comparison, which instead of well to wheel is tank to wheel. Uh, and, and you don't have biomethane, then you're comparing traditional gas uh, to electricity without taking into account the electricity, the CO2 in the electric system, uh, then that's uh, not, not probably the most accurate competition, co uh, comparison. But as mentioned, uh, when looking at biomethane and even normal methane, we're looking at challenging diesel as opposed to uh, challenging electric vehicles that will have uh, a trajectory of their own and will have uh, great success in the industry, no doubt. Uh, even if you take the most optimistic estimates of electric vehicles, you get to 15, 20, 25, 30, some say 40 percent penetration by 2040. That still leaves 60, 70, 80 percent uh, petrol or diesel, which there's no reason why we need to wait to, to address. Okay, thank you. 
Grazie. Please. Hello, it's Antonella Bianchesi from City. Uh, three questions. The first one is very big picture, but uh, the regulatory model is based on a grow uh, dynamic of revenues uh, above inflation, while the underlying business of gas is potentially shrinking. Do you think this is sustainable in the very long term? How these two drivers will converge at some point? Uh, and uh, how SNAM can manage this conversion uh, considering uh, also the balance sheet uh, of the company. Uh, the second question is uh, on the share buyback. Uh, there is a note saying that uh, you bought 440 million euros. Uh, we should assume that this is completed and uh, also if you can uh, discuss if you're going to cancel the shares and when. And uh, the last question is, uh, which is the impact of the 2020 regulatory uh, review embedded in your, uh, in your plan in terms of revenues or EBITDA? Thank you. Thanks very much, Antonella. So on, on the first point, um, uh, as, as I showed in, in that slide, whatever demand outlook you take, we need 100% of the revenue to run a market, call it at 30 or 35 BCM. So before you get to 35, it's 20, 50 or whatever, that, that number out in time is even assuming radical decarbonization. So I see a binary uh, situation either, uh, which is the most likely Europe continues to press ahead with very serious decarbonization and it will need to put billions of euros to do so in, in infrastructure, in, in, in capex, in uh, utility bills will go up, someone will have to pay for this because renewables are still going to be an intermittent. So in that scenario, uh, the infrastructure gains competitiveness because we don't need any extra capex and we can become green without spending real money on the infrastructure. In fact, we can become greener with spending no money on infrastructure whereas electricity becomes way more expensive. Starting from a situation today with very limited renewables, very limited, with significant re renewables, but limited to the 2050 outlook, where electricity uh, on a wholesale level is already three times more expensive than gas. And if you look at electricity at the retail level, when you add on all the incentives for renewables, it becomes even more expensive. So if we go down a deep decarbonization, I think the competitiveness of gas is enhanced, not diminished. So I see no scenario in that instance where we have a diminishing uh, revenue at SNAP. Um, if Europe, uh, or if, let's say there's a breakthrough in CCS, or if we convince India and China, because when we talk about CO2, we're talking about India and China, we're not really talking about Europe, because the coal is, is what's really creating the mess from a climate change perspective. Let's say we found a global solution to CO2 that allows Europe to preserve current policies which are already world leadership. This is a scenario I don't believe in, but some, some advocates are, are, are arguing for this. Then we're simply where we are, and so again, I see no scenario where we shrink uh, our revenues. Uh, as Alice said, our balance sheet is, is uh, there uh, to sustain almost any type of shock, and we've run scenarios, so I would say, with Massimo, we've run an industrial sensitivity on the level of demand needed to justify this in future capex, and that level is very low. We've taken those numbers with the commercial team and tried to look at how expensive gas transmission would be in that absurdly low scenario, and it still is hugely competitive. And then we've run a balance sheet uh, stress case, trying to throw everything at it, but the, the resilience is quite there. And, and being under levered, going back to the previous point, or slightly under levered, is certainly plays in that direction. In terms of share buyback, the number you have for 40, Ali, correct me if I'm wrong, that's the commitment to year end. So some has been done uh, and some hasn't yet been done. Um, and uh, we will cancel all the shares. Uh, we need to keep some for uh, management uh, performance schemes that, as you know, have moved from being cash based to being equity uh, based to better align uh, the incentives of, of our teams. Uh, in the 2020 review, we, I think, are being quite prudent in the sense that we 
uh, are not uh, putting in our numbers any uh, change to the beta, but I think there are very strong arguments looking at the factual evidence uh, that the beta should increase uh, in, this, in this framework. And if you simply uh, put the current forwards, or let's say it differently, the observation period for the current WAC was based on an uh, October to October or September to September uh, window. And the spread really only went up from July. Um, had, had, the sp had the observation period been shorter or had the observation been 2019, the WAC would have gone up to 7% or something like that. So I think this is, this is a kind of uh, starting point as, as we think about 2020. Not implying that that we get anywhere near that, but just just to, just to say the the kind of uh, moral situation we're in. Yeah. Do you want to add something on, on the paper? On the the last question that you had, I think vis-à-vis -vis last plan, the differences are on one side the treatment of working progress for the transportation business, which is uh, more visible that adds to our net income, as well as the extension that we expect on the 10-year incentive, which is now up to 2021. So these are the two main. Aside from the WAC elements. So you see an upside in value? Not in the number. No, no, it's not going to be a meaningful, the more meaningful vis a vis the old plan um, uh, is the work in progress uh, treatment. Hi, it's Anna Maria Scaglia from Morgan Stanley. Um, two very quick questions just to clarify. The first one to follow up on Antonella is in 2020, are you making an assumption in terms of cost clawback? Therefore, your allowed cost going down because we discussed the RAB and the remuneration there. And if you can quantify those. And the second, assumption, second question is about allowed return, both in 2020 and 2019, sorry, in 2022. Are you assuming, uh, I know, I understand you don't want to give the number, but uh, are you assuming the allowed return to be up? in 2019 and eventually by how much and do you assume in 2022 the allowed return to be flat relative to 2021 thank you okay i'll i'll take the the last one and i will give you the second one so yes it will go up i said from 5.4 it could get up to 5.8 uh that's what our demand would be that's what the formula says that's leaving intact the debt to equity there could be some debt to equity deterioration so we factor some of that in into our numbers, and we don't expect any change uh, from uh, um, from uh, twenty, let's say, in twenty twenty two. Now that's somewhat conservative because we have the forward curve, but we don't take into the the WAC any adjustment deriving from a higher forward curve. So going back to what I said before, let's assume the the, the spreads remain where they are today. We would have a much higher WAC in 2022, but we have not put that into into our um, maths. Ale, for the cost, I, I assume we do have the cost clawback. That's uh, so, something that the regulator would, I think, something something that we do and that we've done that is, is, is good to do, is that we've progressed on our cost cutting program, regardless of what the photo year is. So we've skewed, stayed away from tactics in, in cutting costs. And I think it always pays off to be uh, cutting costs whenever you can without worrying too much because ultimately you're transferring the savings to consumers, which is healthy and good, and the regulator likes that. So indeed, we will have some, uh, some consequence of having cut more costs in 18 than we would have done if we were simply cynically looking at what was in our regulatory interest. But confirm that the clawback is embedded in our numbers of the delta efficiencies versus recognized cost. <laughs> but it's going to be as for the latest uh, consultation document on a, on a four-year period horizon. Good morning. Thank you for your presentation. This is Aldo Bonati from uh, Etica SGR. And my question is on the ESG guiding principles uh, and specifically to the social pillar. You mentioned that uh, uh, you launched uh, the SNAM Foundation and one of the key uh, goals of the foundation is engaging with local communities. And my question is uh, if uh, you have already a specific plan for this foundation 
to engage with uh, uh, local communities in the southern of Italy affected by the TAP project, which is going to be launched in two years. And if yes, if you give us some color on this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Aldo. Indeed, the foundation is something that we spend a lot of energy and time on. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to spend a little time on this. We have decided that we have some quite unique skills in this country because of our 1,000 construction sites. Uh, in Italy, it's quite complex to get infrastructure built. The cross of uh, local legislation, regional legislation, national legislation, the uh, codice appalti, so the procurement rules, uh, mean that even for a, a municipality, it's very challenging to get stuff done when it comes to building it. Uh, we have a team of 3,000 people, and most of what we do is managing that process. The engineering, the design, the permitting, the procurement, the construction, and then the operations. So um, we have noticed that very many situations, uh, and a lot of them are in southern Italy, but not only in southern Italy, the municipalities have a lot more money or have money to spend, whether it's EU funds or federal or national funds for projects, but they're unable to execute them. So we have said, rather than the foundation, like other companies have foundations that simply give money, we will give our knowledge and our know-how, which is a lot more effective. So we can go to a municipality and say, the government has given you X million euros to restructure several schools. We can step in in partnership with you and, and make sure the schools are actually built. And this is something that the municipalities like more than the money because the money and often they have already. And so indeed we're doing a lot of this in southern Italy. We have a project ongoing in Sicily. Undoubtedly we will have uh, something in Puglia as well. Uh, but the foundation is not about giving money, it's about getting stuff done. And we can do this in partnership with other foundations. There's a number of banking foundations that again are, are cash rich, but execution is not necessarily always there. So we've decided to focus on the youth poverty, on education, and on the infrastructure. Okay. May we have another question from the conference call? Our question comes from Rui Diaz from UBS. Hello, good morning everyone, and thank you for, for the presentation. I have uh, two questions. The first one is regarding returns. Um, I think that by now it is clear that the regulator is likely to use the current formula to calculate the new WAC for 2019 to 2021 at least. And as you assume in your plan, the likelihood of um, an increase is indeed high. But I was wondering if, if, if is, is there any chance that during the review in 2020, the regulator might fully offset or partially offset this increase with cuts elsewhere? I, I guess that, as you mentioned, you could have some cuts in the allowed OPEX, but could you also have a reduction of some incentives or any other item in the regulation? Essentially, what I'm trying to understand is, what is the downside risk to your current, I would say, positive view on regulation? Um, or if when you when you when you speak with with uh, with the regulator, do you feel that the regulator is rather comfortable with the potential increase in, in gas bills? So this will be my first question about returns. And the second question is more high level regarding your long term uh, outlook for the gas sector. And the question is, if we have a technological breakthrough on storage or batteries. Could this compromise your view regarding the, uh, the importance of gas in Europe? Thank you. So on, on the returns, I think the, um, the impact on, on utility, on household bills is negligible. I think it's uh, below 75 cents uh, per year of what, on what assumption? On every, hundred ba every 10 basis points? is 75 cents, I think. That's the right. calculation. With it. So uh, every, every 10 basis points is 75 cents per, per, per family. So it's, it's, it, that, that's not the issue at all. And as I said, I think our, our argument is the observation was so short that the proper WAC should be much higher than 5.8. Um, 
Now, we don't expect to get anything higher than 5.8, but the only lever, I don't think they will touch output-based incentives because I think it's a win-win situation. They have nothing to do with, uh, with the WAC. Uh, the lever they would have is the beta, but as I said on the beta, I think we have many more reasons why the beta should go up as opposed to going down. And it's, uh, these are very technical uh, discussions that you have with the regulator. It's a non-commercial, non-political discussion. And the regulator is actually really independent. If you look at who they are in some detail, it's, um, it, it's, not, it's not a government entity in any way. And uh, the beta discussion uh, is a discussion based on 20, 30 pages of benchmarks and analysis. It's not something where you could just say, okay, the beta is coming down. There's, there'd be many, many arguments in our camp to say that the beta should go up. So I don't think that's something to worry about, and I don't think the OPEX cut, again, is any way linked to the WAC. Looking at the very long-term future, um, I think eventually, more than on the batteries, I think that we will find a better way to capture the sun's energy. Uh, even the best and latest technologies are still capturing a fraction of the potential of sun. So I expect a breakthrough there. And as I talk to research labs in Stanford and, and other universities, I think that's what people expect in the next 20, 30 years is a real breakthrough on, on, on increasing the efficiency of, of solar. Um, on the battery front, of course, there will have to be improvements. I must say there have been none. Uh, the costs indeed have come down, but if you look at the amount of energy a battery can store and the size of, of batteries, uh, I, 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 I don't see, uh, I, I see costs continuing to fall, but here we're not talking about costs. Here we're talking about the fact that if you want to store energy seasonally, no battery or combination of batteries can do that because you would move from using a battery every four hours. If you look at the chart we showed, we say gas storage is five euros per megawatt hour, battery storage is 200 euros per megawatt hour, but that 200 is run on a four hour cycle. That means you use it six times a day. That means you use it uh, 2,000 times a year. If you were to use that battery for seasonal storage, you could use it only once a year you would have to put summer energy in the battery and then keep it in the basement for just one shot of use in the winter. So that would make the cost go up by, call it 100 times 200, I don't know what the, the maths is, but it's, it's, it's illogical to use that or any other type of current storage for seasonal. Uh, and as the market becomes more global, as China becomes a big buyer of LNG, prices will become very, very seasonal. Just look back at the last three years, winter and summer prices uh, vary a lot. And so that storage advantage, I think, is, is there to stay. And when we will have, finally, that solar breakthrough, that's the time when we go into North Africa and build huge solar farms in North Africa and then use the existing gas pipelines to import that renewable energy in the form of power to gas, because that is by far the best, most effective, cheapest way, not only to help North Africa, but also to import into Europe that renewable energy. Thank you. Javier, please. Thank you. A follow-up question on, on, on that. Uh, uh, I guess uh, the question is, although the, the government has been very clear on, on the, their support to, uh, to TAP and the liabilities that for, for the state, I, th I think they mentioned the interruption of the project uh, could, uh, could mean, um, is still there is debate at a, at, a local, at, the, at a local level. So the question is much more along the lines of, do you think that that noise and that uh, political discussion in the region of, Palia, uh, of Puglia that is still going on maybe affect the timing of the true up for, uh, for TAP? And if you, are see, uh, if you see an scenario in which the conditions for the financing uh, through a uh, depth of the project is, uh, has been worsening because of that debate that is going on and has not finalized. And uh, second question on TAP that is related uh, to that is that uh, I think that you're, in your speech you mentioned that the contribution by the end of the project could be 50, 50 million euros. Uh, could you give us that number at the beginning that I guess is 2021? Okay, so 
uh, you should expect a ramp up. So uh, 2020 is when it starts. 2021 is the ramp up year. 2050, uh, 2020 is is when we when we say 50 million. The on the financing, I don't see any any risk. If anything, the outlook has become better, not worse. And the local uh, opposition uh, indeed is, is still there. And I think what TAP has to do, this is not SNAM, is continue to dialogue as much as they can. But we confirm 2020 as a start time. 50 million, around 50 million euros. From 2021? Oh, 2020. No, 2020 is negative. I mean, uh, uh, it's it's negative 18, 19, 20, 20 it starts, 21 it ramps up, 2022 is, is uh, f around 50 million. And I think the 2021 is just a few million less than 50, so I mean, <coughs> it's, got, it's a very small ramp up, so I don't think it's like 20 million in 2021 and, tw and 50 in 2022. Yeah. Of course, it depends what month of 2020 you start, how the ramp up phases, but say steady state becomes 2022. The financing, I think, is, is a completely separate discussion. We are, it's a complex financing structure. That's why it's taking long. Uh, we have received commitments by commercial banks. We are f working on the documentation. So we, it's just the complexity of the paperwork and the number of actors that make it longer than a usual corporate uh, or a single-handed project financing type of project. So that's what is taking uh, long. It's not related to uh, the recent debate that uh, we've been watching. Yeah, I think is the last question. And thank you. Just a quick follow-up. Um, can you um, update us on the situation and your assumption on the contribution from DESFA? If there are discussions with the government there about uh, the regulation, uh, what you assume in terms of CAPEX, uh, you mentioned in the past that you have requests uh, from several shippers in order to speed up the CAPEX in, uh, in the Greek grid. So can you give us some, uh, some details on this? Thank you. Yeah. Please take this. I think there are no news since uh, the, I mean, vis-a-vis -vis what we told you in the past, simply because as closing hasn't occurred, we haven't yet made our own plan as a new shareholder of DESPA. So uh, I think the guideline of their 10-year strategic plan still uh, um, is a good one, which I think is around, uh, was around uh, 300 or 400 million type of capex uh, for, uh, in the near term. Um, so we are working on finalizing all the documentation and the authorization, the CPs, for getting to closing by year end, which is what we have on target. Um, and then once we will be in the company, we will, of course, uh, provide our own plan to, uh, to, to the financial community. But for the time being, it's a very um, restrictive privatization process and we need to follow the rules. Okay. I think there are no more questions. So, Marco. Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us. To those of you who are staying here, uh, please, I hope you enjoyed the afternoon uh, sessions, and thank you for your participation and your questions. Bye.